welcome to the Ray Harryhausen podcast, the show dedicated to the life, career and films of a special effects titan. Join us as we host in-depth discussions about the work, influences and legacies of this uniquely talented filmmaker. Brought to you by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, we will be delving into Ray's archive to bring a unique insight into his work, including exclusive audio from the man himself. We will be joined by special guests for retrospectives, exclusive announcements and competitions, so this podcast is a must-listen for all fans of the world of Ray Harryhausen, animation and classic filmmaking. So, welcome to episode 13 of the Ray Harryhausen podcast. Lucky number 13, we've got a very special interview lined up for you here today. And I'm joined once more by Foundation Trustee John Walsh. How are you today, John? I'm very well, Connor, and uh, I'm very excited to hear this, this marvellous interview that you've, you've got exclusively um, for, for this month's episode. Yes, this month I spoke to Jason and the Argonauts star, John Kearney, and he was good enough to invite me round to his home and spend the afternoon with me. And uh, what an interesting man. I mean, it's a real honour to speak to somebody who was in what may be one of Ray's most beloved films, Jason and the Argonauts. But he had such interesting memories of that happy time spent in 1963 filming this seminal movie. Um, John, just before we, we move on to John Kearney's interview... What are your memories of his role as Hylas in the 1963 movie? Well, it's interesting because he'd, um, he was one of the most memorable and standout performances, not just because he's a terrific actor, which of course he is, um, but it's a very memorable and, and a very tragic part that he plays because, of course, on the island, they're warned not to take anything from the island except food and water. And then his character is, is very tragically killed. And Hercules stays behind then after Talos... Spoiler alert, by the way. <laughs> um, after Talos um, collapses on top of him, so it's 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 dramatic, it's horrific, and one would wonder whether that would be allowed in a in a family or children's film today. But very memorable, you know. He's in the film briefly. We see him um, sort of intercept and 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 subvert the original um, Olympus um, style competition they have to find the best sailors and the best Argonauts. So he really is quite sort of um, a, a cheeky um, representation, I guess, of the audience, of, of the everyman. And, of course, I had the great privilege of meeting John at Ray's 90th in um, the BFI in London a few years ago. And uh, what a charming man, and what wonderful memories he had of working with Ray, and, and as you say, Connor, working on what's now considered to be an iconic piece of film and, and cinema history. Well, as you say, one of the uh, one of the most memorable parts of uh, of John's character in the film is his kind of friendly rivalry with Nigel Green's Hercules. So you'll hear from the uh, the upcoming interview just some of the some of the behind the scenes, the nature of of, of his uh, relationship with Nigel Green. Um, now, for those of you that don't know, John went on to become uh, a very famous public figure in Scotland and elsewhere for uh, portraying Robert Burns and over the years he was really the the embodiment of Robert Burns on stage. Uh, He now is a a writer, a painter and as you'll hear a raconteur and has performed a series of one man shows over the years. So this was a a very interesting interview and he's a very captivating man to listen to. Uh, So without further ado let's listen to John Kearney. Jason and his band of Argonauts, the mightiest warriors the world of adventure has ever known in search of the fabulous magic golden fleece. I'm joined today by a very special guest, one of the stars of Jason and the Argonauts, John Kearney. How are Mm. you, John? Well, I wasn't a star in the film, no billing at all, really, but it was a start. It was a start in a film for me. How I re- what I remember best is uh, my first interview in order to get the film. I was interviewed by Mr. Charles Schneer in his office in London. And like any big director, he sat at the window with his back to the window, so you only saw his silhouette at a big desk with lots of stuff on it and a long carpet leading from the door to his the chair. I came walking in at the door 
walk down the long carpet to this fellow sitting at the end and without looking up he was writing something he said take a chair so I lifted this chair that was beside me and he suddenly looked up and he said what the f I said where do you want me to take it he said oh wise guy and that's how I started in Jason and the Argonaut but he just uh, when he put me onto the film then I met Harry and that was it was the he was in charge of special effects he was immediately avuncular he was the kind of fellow we all warmed to and the director Don Chaffee lovely man of course uh, and I think I knew the, the writer from my London time but I didn't know anyone until I was paired with Nigel Green who was an older actor from the old school and took no nonsense you know you're one of the up-and-coming big heads he said to me so we'll have to watch you all this sort of stuff but I was made comfortable shall we say but when the actual filming started uh, the next big memory is uh, in Rome uh, we were filming the interior and the Italians had a very proper regard for the essentials in life and when they weren't filming actually with uh, silencio for the film they sang and talked and yelled and uh, did all this around about us and that was going on um, when they, uh, they set up for this scene where Nigel Green and I had to push open a big door and then the light flashed in our face you see what I mean but because of all the pre-rehearsal noise that was going on in the studio they'd forgotten to put a shield on the light so I had to open the door I mean Nigel did most of the pushing I followed on after him but the light caught me right in the, my eyes as, I, as the door opened that was the effect required and I blinked Ooh it was powerful and the heat was powerful almost knocked the lines out of our heads so we did it very convincingly being blinded by the sun etc uh, so the scene happened and was uh, printed I got home again taken by the big swanky car to my hotel room in Rome up to the hotel room uh, into the smart clothes for have a good time at night uh, with the rest of the boys and I came out of the, opened the wardrobe, went in for my uh, good jacket, as opposed to the rubbish clothes I wore to the studio. Uh, and I turned back into the room and couldn't see. I was suddenly blinded. So I let out a yell. Ah! By God, it was heard in Glasgow, I think. I was absolutely black blinded. And a, a woman came in immediately, it was a woman because I remembered her soft hurried presence being pressed upon me as I stood there in my smart shirt and trousers and no eyes, yelling like mad, I'm blind, I can't, and reverting totally to Glasgow. I can't you see, I, can't. I forgot about my posh English accent, I forgot about what I had to do, I just remembered I was a, a little Glasgow boy blinded and the woman was saying, it's all right, I'll get it, it's happened before, it's happened, I didn't understand, she had an Irish accent and I didn't know why she was talking like that and I, I said, oh, what do I do? Said, oh, go, I'll get the man in, I'll get the man in who comes, hold on, I'll get the man in and she was yelling for somebody else somebody else come in and lay me on the bed and I no push me on the bed I was lying on the bed going oh god, god have you ever been blinded no nope. have you ever seen only blackness have you ever been put to the absolute last resort I thought I'll either wet myself or disgrace myself I'll do something terrible my hands were shaking I just couldn't see and therefore to my mind I couldn't be which is just rubbish so I was put back lying this is the Jason and the Argonauts experience for me I'm lying in a hotel room 
looking at blackness. And then big Nigel comes in from two doors along in his room. Oh, John, what do we do? He was all right because he was taller than I was and to the side and I got the broken light right in my face. He was, he escaped, but he didn't because he had come in on me as we did the dialogue and he was away in one eye and he said, I'm actually, I thought I've got something in my eye and he went blind with me and he's going, oh, for God's sake, I better get back to my room. And I thought, what is going on here? He went along with one of the women to his room. I lay there until a voice came in at the door. Or it was a rattle of bottles. And a voice said, You all right, boy? I went, What? It was Richard Burton. He was on something or other, and he'd heard it would gone round that I had my face blown off or some terrible accident or some. Anyway, he came in with two bottles of champagne and he fed me with the champagne and dripped it all down my neck and we had the bottle. And so we talked then about everything under the sun. Anyway, enough of uh, background stuff. That was the main thing for the Jason thing. Not f uh, working with Rick, really. not being directed by him and not the director because it was a special effect. I had to be crushed by a bloomin' giant who was invisible, who existed in the sky according to a clock face given me by Harry Harryhausen. The clock face was the giant's head at 12 o'clock and his feet at 6 o'clock and his arms at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. So, And they called out a number and I looked in that direction as I ran along a beach and then appropriately fell flat in my face. There was I, a working actor of a minor distinction, and all I had to do was fall flat in my face in the sand. But being directed by that lovely man, I was happy to do so. And I ended up being part of the Jason Circus, which has gone on since then. It's funny, the, the film has a... Uh, attend an iconic status that has nothing to do with its uh, artistic ability. It's the actual honesty of the nonsense in it and the, f the falsity of models and the falsity of monsters and the falsity of actors, but nonetheless being taken quite seriously. And I, I, I remember once at a book signing, I, I write books from time to time, and a man said, I saw you and Jason the Argonauts, yes. You know, every time I have a bad day at work, he said, I come home and I switch on my copy of Jason and the Argonaut and it's medicine. And I said, well, that's the way to look on a work of art because it's now, a, it's now a work of art. It was never intended to be a work of art. It was just another film along the way. But it's, it's been given a timelessness by the public's reaction to it. They have adopted it. Jason and the Argonauts doesn't belong to Columbia Pictures or Charles Schneer. It belongs to the public, the film-going public. You see, I talked about uh, being blinded through my work on the film. The people who make it now sit in the dark and watch it. So that's the analogy I remember. They are blind to the rest of the world as long as it's happening. That's the important thing about Jason. It takes them out themselves to become other selves. They know it's nonsense. They know it's not true. They know I wasn't uh, pummeled by the giant because they've seen me recently in something else. Simple as that. Or they've seen me give a talk here in Glasgow or Edinburgh. I can only travel that far now. When you consider I've been to New Zealand and Lapland and all that. I think I went everywhere in the world where there was a Scot. So they are everywhere in the world. And that's why uh, I saw the world through Scottish eyes via Robert Burns. But he said, catch the moments as they fly. Use them as you ought, man. 
Believe me, happiness is shy, and doesn't it come when sought, man? Well, happiness came to me in that film, has visited me ever since, and the many things that have happened to me because of that film. Jason and his band of Argonauts, the mightiest warriors the world of adventure has ever known, in search of the fabulous magic golden fleece. John, you told us one of your traumatic experiences on set, being blinded by the light. But do you have any particular favourite memories from filming Jason and the Argonauts? Oh, without a doubt, it was throwing the discus under the water. Because Nigel Green said, you can't even lift it, never mind throw it. And I skimmed it over the water and accidentally got about three bounces. Totally accidentally. And pretended, of course... It was a skill, but it wasn't. It was a trick, an accident, but it was a lovely, enjoyable moment. So life imitates art, because in the film, Hercules is teasing you and saying, yes, your that's... character Hylas, and you'll never hit the stone, and that's then you right. manage it. And that's... that happened actually on set as that's well. That's right. Well, no, it was on set, it was on location. On location. You so know, yeah. on the beach, more or less, around in there. And I never thought, I, I thought it would go straight into the water. But then, boom, boom, boom. And we cheered. Excellent. Well, that's a lovely story, and that ties in really nicely with your, your character, Hylas, who was supposed to be the brains of the operation, yes. so you were obviously right for the part. <laughs> um, I would like to ask a little more about what it was like for you as an actor working with Ray um, in terms of technical aspects, because as you said, you were acting to an invisible yeah. creature. Um, part of our archive is all of Ray's key drawings which he created which are works of art in themselves but were also practical because he would show them to the actors before scenes to give them an idea of what what it was going to look like in the end Mm. Um, how how was that for you looking over Ray's drawings and comparison sketches I I didn't look over Ray's drawing I don't know whether it was because we were in such a bland outdoor material place and facing only sand, sea and air. Clouds, well very few clouds in that part. A blue, blue, blue sky. We were dealing with an empty palette. So he just wanted me to fill it by my reaction, not by anything else. He was relying on my ability as a performer to lie convincingly. And he just said, you do your job, I've done my job. So I just want to see it come up to the level of my job. Because you see, when he did his job, he saw the scene. He saw the scene, which is why he was able to make these lovely artworks of his own vision of the scene. But he relied on mere fallible faces to bring it off. You know, so he just told me what he wanted and then react accordingly. In other words, John, you're afraid. That's your basic emotion. You're seeing something that's about 20 feet tall coming to pummel you. That's the main expression. And you're trying to run to avoid it. And he's after you. And you know that one step of his makes up a 100-yard sprint for you. So that's why he wanted me panicking and breathless as well. So I was running up and down before we said action. So that he got exactly what he wanted. No, he was, in a sense, the kindest man to be ruthless on the film set. And that's the loveliest combination. Because I would have done anything for him. You know, had I been working against a real big man being a giant, it would have been a different kind of show and a different kind of reaction. I would have reacted only to the face I see. But instead, I had an... I had no face to see. I was just called out numbers. How would you like to react to 12 o'clock? Here's the man who just played the Hamlet, reacting to 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock. But he is also running, remember. The cameraman is being pulled. And it was a, a running operation. And his direction was a running commentary. That's how I reacted to him. But in the minutes between, there was time to get the breath back, time to talk about it. That's when he gave you a purpose for the scene, where I fitted in and so on. And then I asked him in the script, you know, although it was, I knew the script writer because I arrived in Rome with them. Uh, but I knew the script. I said, 
why isn't big Nigel with me now when I needed him <laughs> you see and he said no it's better that you die alone so nearly every actor I worked with is gone now long retired or gone but uh, God bless the ones who are still here God bless the ones who still have memories and can remember these lovely days and pictures like Jason so the 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 career was lucky and a lucky moment in it I want to stress was the month spent on Jason and so. just thinking about audience reactions how did you feel when you saw the finished film because it was obviously so different from perhaps what you what you maybe read in the script with yeah. these special effects added and the wonderful Bernard Herrmann score yeah. I mean, what was your what was your first impressions of the overall finished I, film I can't remember because uh, I was working away when it came out and I never got to see it till it was well out. It was in London and I was driving past a cinema. I saw it advertised. And I thought, where? And I stopped the car then. I was driving from the studio Hammer Pictures. I was playing a pirate chief in a Hammer film and I saw Jason uh, and the Argonauts advertised on a film somewhere like Ealing or so. and I stopped the car went in I saw it started in a few minutes or so so I just went in oh I thought it was wonderful because it was all it all made sense you know uh, actors only really when they're working on the film are concerned with the scenes they're in just because the scenes they're not in are really none of their business that's up to other actors with the same director and the same cameraman and the same sound man that's up to other actors to make it good, good luck to them but we've only got I'd about eight scenes in the film or something like that I wasn't a leading role at all I was out of the film quite soon but what is extraordinary about that I've been remembered for being out of the film quite early so it meant that what I remember about seeing that film from the cinema en passant was that I stayed in to see the end of it and I thoroughly enjoyed it and it got better and better from my death on <laughs> but I remember it was a very kind of two o'clock audience you know what I mean but I saw it and I had no idea that it would become iconic which the film had become it's just another film but it was enjoyable but I enjoyed it much in the manner of a, a young boy enjoying it you know just switched off and just oh look at that then I got a fright or you know at other things and then I, I was just and I could imagine if I had really been seven or eight when I started going to films I'd have been scared stiff of the film really at the end but I saw it it had the ability that I told you about that a managing director who sees it every time he has a bad day at the office. It really has the ability to let take you out your seat and put you in there. What else need you ask of a film? I don't think it won any Oscars. Well, that's interesting because Ray eventually did receive his Oscar oh, oh, oh. in 1992. Well, of course he would. And when Tom Hanks presented him with his Oscar, he said... Jason and the Argonauts is the greatest film ever made. Yeah. That's Tom Hanks' <laughs> opinion. Yes. So that just, uh, that kind of yes. sums up what was you're saying about the legacy. Yes. At the time, maybe it wasn't yes. recognised. Yeah. 40 years later, people yeah. realised what an important film it was. Of course, of course. The Argonauts, caught in the clutches of the towering bronze giant Talos. And we have here a replica of Talos himself, the creature that we've been talking about. Yeah. The creature which landed on you and caused your character Hylas to, to yeah. die. I'm glad he didn't weigh as heavy as that thing does. No, this is <laughs> a, a, we have a bronze replica here, but this is actually created from Ray's original moulds and it's yes. a, a replica that Ray made himself. This creature, Talos, was voted in a poll by Empire magazine as the second greatest movie monster or movie creature of all time. Second only to King Kong, who of course was Ray's favourite. So of course. How does it feel to be associated with such an iconic creature and a, and a cinematic uh, legend? Well, I'm afraid I never gave the big invisible thing to me any, any great thought other than what the, the reaction would be as an actor, as a person, 
to seeing a thing like that, you see, because I hadn't seen it. He showed me the course, the drawings, you know, at the beginning. He said, just imagine that multiplied by 10 or something like that. Uh, but seeing it now, out of the fright of my life, you see, if if they did it now, they would have ways of throwing an image up into the air now, which they couldn't do then. You remember, 63 was a much less sophisticated age than today. And Harryhausen was almost aeons ahead of his time. That's where we couldn't appreciate. We were accommodating a good man who seemed to know what he was talking about. A rare event in film. He got the physical reaction that he was... I mean, I didn't get it first take all, all the time, don't get me wrong. Back to the starting point, rub out the, the footmarks, away we go again. It was a film, after all. But he appeared to get what he wanted because he just came and patted me on the back when I was lying on the ground. He said, good boy. And I felt like a dog. I felt I should bark, you know, because he was very much in charge. J Jason and the Argonauts is a, a directorial film. And uh, I mean that it comes from the outside and it came from the... Uh, Innovator and Innovator, he did both jobs. He'd, he described, he got it in his head, had it in his heart, and he carried it out from his brain. So well, I think this is maybe something that people at the time didn't realise, that just how involved Ray was with every aspect of the film, not oh, no. just the animation. Oh, but... sorry, sorry. We recognise that totally in making the film. He was there about, so that I can't speak for other scenes with other actors, but as far as scenes I was in with Nigel and so on, um, he was there all the time. In fact, we, we responded to him. <laughs> that's, uh, that's very true, and it's really interesting to hear you say just how much Ray was, how, how Ray recognised Ray was as, uh, as the yeah. person behind the film. Because now when you... You get a box set of Ray's films and it's got the Ray Harryhausen collection written on yeah. the front, which is quite unusual for a special of effects course, person to, to be known by name. And and uh, the film is now, it's played every Christmas and every Easter in the UK yeah. and it's a real event that people... You've got to remember, to. he was a, like Orson Welles, he had his own mind for his own project and it was to be done in his own way. That's Orson Welles. Now, something you touched on earlier and something you were telling me before we started speaking here is that um, you were nearly involved in another Harryhausen project and you were kind of earmarked for a spin-off from the Three Worlds of Gulliver movie. Can you tell yeah. us a little more about that? Because I'm, I'm not sure that many people know about this. Well, no, the, the, uh, I don't know about it because I never got there. But uh, all I know that I was under contract to make, I think it was three films or whatever it was. I know that they, they spent a lot of money on me and they took me to Hollywood. Uh, so they were, they were earnest, Columbia, I mean. So I'm glad, grateful to them for that. I didn't really know what the next project was going to be. I thought, yes, but yes, it was Gulliver because a photo was taken of me in costume standing on the thing and it was look forward to the new Gulliver. That's right, it was Gulliver. And he was going to be the effects man on that. And I was to play Gulliver. And then I was did all the pre-publicity things in Hollywood and was sent back to, to Britain again. So in a parallel universe, you could have been in a TV series of Gulliver yes. with Ray doing all of the special yes. effects. Because they, they had me in a, a long... I don't know what the contract was. Uh, but I was just uh, another um, possible hired hand. Let's put it that way. And did you happen to see much of Ray in later years? Because uh, I know that you were at his 90th birthday yes, celebration. Yes. Did you see him again yes, uh, that before was... then? No, I saw him once again in London, one time. I didn't go to his house. There was something we were... Was it an art thing? I know that I saw him unexpectedly in an art gallery. I can't remember. Because I go to... I'm now an artist, so I'm paying. I began at art school. I've now returned to it. The wheel goes right round and so on. But the, uh, he was interested in art, naturally, as an artist himself. Uh, and then when we went to that 90th thing, 
and I spoke there I remember ad lib or whatever it was and he just sat me beside him and he said just how are you yourself now what are you doing now well here we've lost you to theatre yeah yeah what are you doing and how are your children I said they're all very pretty and they've all married well four daughters married to millionaires I'm the poorest of them all what about your son I said well he's, he's just graduated from Cambridge I think he wants to be alright I don't know but he got to the personal man I remember the two of us were, my wife had to come and look for us and the, uh, the announcer never even came near me at the end of it you know? <laughs> but anyway it was a there were lovely people I met there and I met the the actor I knew, the young, the other young actor. Who's the other young it's one? Gary Gordon. Raymond. That's yeah. it. Yeah. So I, I met Gary and I saw her again. And it was a lovely reunion. We felt we, felt we were in a, a special uh, brigade of actors. We'd been on, a, a, on a, an expedition of our own that was quite unique. And we were all members of we should have been given a, a Harryhausen badge and we should make that in the 90th come make a badge and call it the HH well actually last year we ran a logo competition well that, that's that's my you entry. should have entered yeah we should well, have got you involved I'll show you we had some incredible winning entries oh yeah uh, well, I mean, um, but at that 90th birthday there was the new generation of yes. actors and directors <clears throat> yeah. who've grown up on Ray's films. Yeah. How did you feel seeing this, you know, being a part of Ray's work and then seeing the generation of people who were influenced by him? Simple. Honoured. No more than that. Because I get that now from younger people who are told by their parents, did you know John was in J And the eyes turn round and go, wow, who were you? I said... I was the one that went under the giant. <gasps> I'm only remembered for that. You know what I mean? They don't remember being blinded. Hmm. They, don't, they don't remember the nice salary I was on. They don't remember all these incidentals. So lots of memories are associated with being in Jason and the Argonauts. And they are all anyone would die for. And I don't want to say any more. Jason and the Argonauts, a search that became a legend. So John, what did you think of that? How did you find listening to John's memories of filming Jason and the Argonauts? Well, it was fabulous. You know, I think, you know, John really captured the moment there because for most jogging actors, and he was a very young man when he made the film, it was a job, it was a good job, and you're always looking for the next job, as he did. And he worked on, on many other projects, and as you said, he's become quite a, an iconic figure in Scotland. Um, and he's 87 as well. It's hard to imagine that you're listening to an 87-year-old because he sounds very sprightly. I know you've published a photo online with uh, with a model of Talos, and, and John certainly doesn't look 87, you know. Um, so he, he's a very young person. So I think in terms of cinema history, he'll always be remembered as the young Argonauts. But I was fascinated by that, and, and also by the Gulliver TV series, which I'm not sure I'd heard about before. Had you, Connor? No, this was actually, I have to admit, when I was doing my research before uh, going to meet with John, I, I noticed that the, he had actually taken part in a, a pilot or an attempted pilot of uh, The Three Worlds of Gulliver, which is going to be a TV series. And it was actually when I was speaking to, to John when I first arrived at his house and he, he made me a nice cup of tea, we were chatting about it and he remembered um, you know, being in the costume dressed as Gulliver, being tied down and uh, Ray in the background, f you know, figuring out what animation they could have had in this television series. There may well be some uh, some diagrams or some scripts here in the archive because it's yet another lost treasure, something very interesting. A, a Ray Harryhausen television series would have been really wonderful to see. It would have been. When we think about that around the time this would have been, it's when there's been an explosion with the Walt Disney Company creating lots of very successful uh, brands and strands under the wonderful world of Disney uh, for ABC television and really transforming the way that big studio majors worked with with the little small box in the corner that was such a threat so I can see the attractiveness and why Charles Schneer and Ray thought that television could be another step for them 
it would have been fascinating had there been a, a wonderful world of Ray Harryhausen for television. Um, how fabulous. Yes, it's quite it's quite a tantalising thought. I'm sure a lot of fans would have absolutely loved that. Um, but the thing, I think the main thing that I took away from speaking with John and from his interview was just how, in such high regard, that he held Ray, and how much he, you know, he looked back with fondness on his days of, of filming Jason and of spending time with Ray. Because obviously, John's career took a different direction, and he he went on to work heavily in the theatre for the rest of his life. But he never forgot um, the time that he spent with Ray and just how much he admired Ray's work and Ray's personality. So it's great to hear that on Ray's 90th birthday, he and John kind of caught up and the the decades faded away and they reminisced about their time in Italy together. No, definitely. You know, and, and Ray straddles both sides of the divide here because having been on film sets myself, you know, having directed um, feature films, nothing of the size of Jason the Argonauts, but actors... Um, can sometimes hang with the director if it's very much an actor's director, but the technical side, the heavy mechanical side of making a film is so laborious, regardless of which era this, this is taking place in, that there tends to be quite a, a divide between the artisans, if you like, the writers, the makeup people, the, the designers and the, and the actors, um, and then the technicians, the cameramen, the sound men, uh, the lighting people and special effects. Interestingly, Ray straddled both sides because, of course, he was a, a scientific and technical innovator. So was somebody who film crews were very excited to work with. But, of course, he was a real artist in every sense of that word. So, you know, artists like John Kenny were, were quite naturally drawn to Ray Harryhausen. So it is interesting, you know, all these years later that um, Ray crossed the divide, as it were, of being more than, more than just a special effects person. Um, and that segues us nicely onto um, a special announcement, albeit a 25th anniversary announcement, that um, this month um, and the week that we're recording this podcast in, um, we're recording it on the week starting the, uh, the 27th of March 2017, um, is the 25th anniversary of Ray receiving his one and only Oscar from Tom Hanks at a special Oscar ceremony. Isn't that right, Colin? Yeah, that's right. 25 years ago, Ray received his, his long-awaited Academy Award, the Gordon E. Sawyer Award, uh, presented to him by Master of Ceremonies Tom Hanks and, quite fittingly, his oldest and best friend, Ray Bradbury. And we're putting together a very special video to commemorate this event. We've been given access to the full clip of Ray's acceptance speech and it's going to be very interesting to, to hear his, his thoughts on receiving this award, this prestigious award. And we'll be looking back with some fondness with people who were there on that evening. And it really, you know, it's appropriate that Ray received the Oscar from Tom Hanks. Because as we heard, as I mentioned to, to John Kearney, Tom Hanks went on to say that Jason and the Argonauts was the greatest film of all time. And that wasn't just Tom being nice. That's, uh, that I've, I've seen this... Uh, being said elsewhere as well. He's a huge fan of Ray's work and he really thought that Jason and the Argonauts was the film that made him want to be an actor. Absolutely. You know, and and in terms of the, um, if you like, the controversy around receiving or not receiving an Academy Award, there wasn't always a category for special visual effects in, uh, in the Oscars. So it was a category that came and went. It was only, um, somebody can correct me on this, but I think it was only from the early 70s that there was a permanent category for this. And then after Star Wars, of course, it changed things dramatically. Um, but the fact that Ray wasn't honoured sooner, um, it, it's, it still rankles with people. And, you know, I'm thrilled that the Academy gave him his Oscar and they were quite right to do so. But, you know, in the past, there are lots of filmmakers who didn't receive an Oscar that perhaps should have done. Stanley Kubrick, of course, never received one for any of his films for directing anything um, and nor did um, Alfred Hitchcock so there are quite a few people who um, who were nominated perhaps but didn't win and in Ray's case you know there are different films that should have been nominated in fact they should have won for pretty much every film he did because within the time and space Ray was working there was nobody else really to touch him um, so like Walt Disney who received many Oscars quite deservedly you know Ray Harryhausen in my view should be um, sitting with a backdrop of 16 or so Oscars, but thrilled to be celebrating the anniversary this week and uh, and thrilled that Ray finally received um, the recognition, Connor. 
Yes. Now, in 1992, you knew Ray very well because you'd uh, you'd filmed your documentary with him. Do you remember any of Ray's personal feelings on on receiving this award, or did he did he tell you any any of his kind of anecdotes about the evening itself? Well, he was thrilled to receive it from Ray Bradbury, of course, because they'd been great friends and uh, and great colleagues. They'd worked um, on Ray's first film, The Beast, from Twenty Thousand Fathoms, which was a short story. Um, written for, I think it was the, uh, was it the Washington Post? I'll be corrected on that if it's not. Um, but um, no, Ray was thrilled. I mean, I asked him about this idea of not being nominated and the fact that the category didn't exist um, and it kind of came and went. And he was quite pragmatic about these things. You know, Ray was very much a, a glass half full person. He was very much an optimist. And I think that's why he's he, he, he lasted as long as he did and was as successful as long as he was. But he was absolutely thrilled to be um, to be honoured because there was a sense after Clash of the Titans, he made that in, was released in 1981, but he'd been making it since 79. I met him in the late 1980s to make my short film school film. Even then he thought that people had forgotten, people didn't want to know, his phone wasn't ringing. Um, so there was that sense that he thought that time had, passed his work by so absolutely thrilled to be receiving the oscar and um, more crucially thrilled that the reception was so strong because of course it was full of well wishers it was full of contemporary people like tom hanks who in the clip looks very very young he looks like he's only 20 um, so the idea that uh, present day cinema was embracing him and his work i think you know filled him with with great pride and, and rightly so but as a very humble man I don't think he took for granted the fact that he would always be remembered in Hollywood history. Uh, but of course, he always will be. Well, we've got some lovely pictures from the evening. We've got uh, Ray with his wife, Diana, and his daughter, Vanessa, um, all looking wonderful and looking delighted to receive his award. Um, so we'll include these in the video too. Uh, please follow us on facebook.com slash Ray Harryhausen or twitter.com slash Ray underscore Harryhausen. Um, we'll be we'll be publishing this video very soon, and it's going to be a real celebration of a, a much deserved war- award for Ray. Um, speaking of our social media and uh, our website, the poster book which we announced last month has been a, a huge success so far. Um, we've received emails and messages from fans throughout the world who have inundated us with some fantastic very rare and very unusual Ray Harryhausen posters. What have you made of our entries so far, John? I'm thrilled because uh, the, the most fascinating thing is to see variants on p- posters that we know. Uh, double bills, which I never knew had been placed together. Some of the most bizarre double bills I've seen. I, I won't disclose them because I don't want to be spoiling too many of the surprises. Uh, and, and the quality as well. You know, so many old posters tend to be in quite a poor condition because they were designed to be used for a few weeks and then discarded. But collectors out there, of course, have kept things in pristine condition and have maybe had them rolled and kept them away from sunlight. So very, very excited. I mean, we have some terrific stuff, of course, in the Ray Harryhausen archive. But to find things from fans and to have fans included in the book is so exciting. There's been lots of online chatter. People are keen to have their name mentioned on the page where their poster will be listed. Very exciting. I'd very much like to be able to contribute to that and have my name listed, but sadly I don't think I can provide any posters other than the usual um, ones that you might find. Um, but it's very exciting. And I know Richard Hollis, who's busy working away on this, is, uh, is uh, grateful for any of the inquiries that come through because um, you know the more momentum we can build for the book and the more excitement, the better. And we do have some very exciting plans when the book is released, to maybe have a, a, an exhibition of some of the original poster artwork um, as a venue perhaps in London. I think that's right. And what I would say, based, just uh, touching on what you were uh, talking about there, John, is um, some of the most interesting posters we've received have come with the message, somebody assuming that we'd have these already. So the message will say, oh, you probably have already seen this, but just in case, here's my poster collection. And actually that's been some of the most interesting posters we've had yet and I've, I've passed the messages on to Richard and he's actually said please you know how, how can we look into getting a high-res scan of this poster so if you've got any posters lurking in your collection and you maybe think oh they'll, they'll not be interested in these by all means send us through because it's great to see them anyway and 
you never know. Like you know, some of some of the most interesting posters we've received have been from fans across the world. Absolutely, and what a great gift to give to a friend or relative a copy of a book that features a poster that you've supplied um, for one of the iconic films of Ray Harry Hansen. Um, very exciting stuff. Exciting times, Connor. Yes, definitely. What, a, and you'll be part of the Ray Harryhausen legacy. You'll be. You'll have your name written there uh, next to the picture used in the book. Well, I think that's uh, all our news for this month, John. We do have uh, some exciting exhibitions lined up for the summer. Uh, we mentioned last time our, our Barbican exhibition. Just to remind you, the, the Into the Unknown exhibition of race science fiction works um, start, begins on the 2nd of June. And so that we're, we're gearing up for that. That's going to be a really interesting look at some of Ray's most famous science fiction themed creations and some interesting prototypes as well. So again, keep an eye on our social media for updates on the exhibition and some of the models which are going to be on display there. Excellent. Looking forward to that. And looking forward to um, episode 14. Any, any previews to what that might be? Episode 14 um, is going to be something quite interesting, per potentially another interview. I don't want to give too much away, but we have uh, been in touch with one of, the, one of the stars of Ray's films and uh, should have some very interesting recollections. And of course, we have some anniversary celebrations this year still to celebrate Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger and 20 Million Miles to Earth. We'll be doing dedicated episodes on both of those films, packed with unheard interview footage from the archive and anecdotes which you may not be aware of. So stay tuned for episodes 14, 15, 16 and beyond as we look forward to a busy summer with the Ray Harryhausen collection. Excellent. I'm going to go off now, write my fantasy Hollywood Oscar acceptance speech as uh, as I look forward to watching your um, your video that you're going to make. Excellent. Look out for it. Cheers, John. Thanks. Take care, Connor. Bye now. Copyright in the Ray Harryhausen podcast is owned by the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, a registered Scottish charity, number SC001419, 2017. This recording may not be reproduced in whole or in part without the written permission of the Foundation. The views expressed within these podcasts do not necessarily reflect those of the Foundation, its trustees or employees. For further terms and conditions, please contact us at rayharryhausen.com where you can also find our Facebook and Twitter links.